So this is the system we'll be looking at for the control system design videos. This is the balanced error pendulum and this is what I've been making for the past one to two weeks. You can see here this is a kind of a stainless steel fixture. Then I've put this rod and a pivot mechanism up here. So it's basically just an axle with a hollow um, steel shaft around it so it can rotate about that point. Um, at either end we have the DC brushed motors and propellers. I chose brushed motors because they're easier to drive. Uh, these mounts I 3D printed and the propellers I 3D printed on either end. So yes, so these are going to be our main actuators, these propellers. And you can see it can rotate freely about the pivot with relatively little friction. The way we're sensing the angle is via this pot and chanter and this little assembly over here. Now it's a bit hard to see in the light, but these are actually two gears. So one large gear attached to the pivot and then one smaller gear which is attached to the shaft of the potentiometer. So that way when the larger gear rotates, the smaller gear rotates and that in turn rotates the shaft of the potentiometer and we can just read off an applied voltage. So that seems like a fairly simple solution to figuring out what angle this um, rod is currently at. You can see here I had actually 3D printed a, a mount for an inertial measurement unit, but that uh, sensor turned out to be far too noisy and I think this is a, a fairly elegant solution in place. Before we can design a control system, we need to have a mathematical model of the system dynamics we wish to control. In our case, the balanced aero pendulum turns out to be a fairly linear system with relatively simple equations of motion. To arrive at a system model useful for controller design, we start off by drawing a free body diagram, defining system parameters such as masses, lengths, angles and so on, as well as showing all forces and moments acting on the system. By using Newton's laws of motion, we can sum these forces and moments to arrive at a governing differential equation. By applying the Laplace transform to this differential equation, we get a transfer function representation of the system. This is our basis for what we'll be using for control system design. However, this is not the whole story. To provide the forces that drive the system, we require actuators, or in our case, motors with propellers. The dynamics of these actuators also need to be taken into account. Finally, we'll combine the previously mentioned models with sensor and DAC approximations to arrive at the overall model of our system. There will be a fair amount of maths in this video, so if you require any clarification, please leave a message in the comments. Without further ado, let's get started. Shown here is the free body diagram of the balanced error pendulum, that is, a rather simplified version. We assume that we have a thin rod of length L and of mass big M, rotating about a pivot at the rod's center, which is this point O. The angle that the rod makes with a horizontal is denoted by theta. At either end of the rod are motors with repellers, modeled as point masses, each of mass little m, and each providing a thrust force F1 and F2. Finally, we will model the friction at the pivot via the friction coefficient c. The moment the friction generates is proportional to the rate of change of the angle and opposes the rotational motion of the rod. So if the rod is rotating counterclockwise, the friction acts in the opposing direction. Thus, the larger value that c has, the more the system is damped. Now, I have purposely left out finer details of this system. For instance, the masses of the motors will most likely not be identical, the rod is not thin, uh, the friction coefficient is non-linear, and so on and so forth. As is typically the case with control system design, we aim to design a controller that can cope with all expected parameter variations in this system. We now need to sum the moments of the free body diagram. The sum of moments, or torques rather, is equal to the angular acceleration multiplied by the moment of inertia big I, of the system, and this is from Newton's second law. The moment of inertia, I, is an object's resistance to rotational acceleration. This is analog to the mass in the case of linear acceleration, and we'll see how to calculate I later. Now the moment balance therefore becomes, by using this equation and then summing the torques, this equation over here, and we get that by doing a simple mo moment balance of the free body diagram. Now we have two motors, each exerting a force, F1 and F2 respectively, but we can make our lives a lot easier by letting each motor run at the same idle force, so F0, so it's running, I don't know, at 50% duty cycle. And then we have a plus minus, 
perturbation, let's call it delta F, around that idle force. Now, instead of, instead of controlling two forces, F1 and F2, we simply control one force, delta F. Now, note the plus and minus sign difference. This is because F2, shown over here, tends to increase theta, whereas F1 tends to decrease theta. Substituting these new force expressions into the original equation over here yields the final single input, single output differential equation down here. Now this is great because we've substantially simplified the system into a single input, single output one, but also it is linear, which makes our lives a lot easier for controller design later on. With the differential equation in place, we may begin to wonder how we calculate the parameters of the system, so for example I or C. Let's have a brief look now, but I will go into greater detail in the next video. Now we can approximate the moment of inertia by assuming that the rod is thin and has two point masses, those being the motor and propellers, at each end. Now using standard results, uh, we arrive at a simple expression for the moment of inertia. So we take the moment of inertia of the rod, rotating about the centre, plus two times the moment of inertia of these point mass motors, and we arrive at this expression. Now remember this is uh, very approximate, and I will, I will calculate the moment of inertia in more detail in the next video. One thing to notice is that the magnitude of the moment of inertia is dependent on L squared, and also notice how it is dependent on the rod mass and also the motor mass. Now more interestingly, what about C, the friction coefficient? This is a rather, or well, very uncertain parameter, and we don't have direct ways of measuring it. It is non-linear, dependent on materials, areas, masses, and so forth. But the question is, can we somehow bound its magnitude? So can we say it's between like zero and two? Now this, again, this is something we'll look at in detail in the next video. We now have all we need to convert the differential equation into a transfer function. This will be used for controller design later on. Recall that for zero initial conditions, the Laplace transform of a derivative is simply the Laplace transform variable multiplied by s. Therefore, combining this knowledge with the original differential equation, uh, we arrive at this expression. Um, now rearranging, we arrive at the transfer function for the balanced error pendulum. The input is the change in force, delta f, in newtons, and the output is the angle of the rod with respect to the horizontal, and the units are in radians. Let's ask ourselves if this transfer function makes sense. I always find it useful to think if the transfer function intuitively represents the dynamics of the system, what we'd expect it to do based purely on our everyday physical understanding of the world. Now first of all, we have a gain L, which is the rod length. If we increase the rod length, the effectiveness or the moment arm of the motors is increased. However, recall that the moment of inertia actually increases with L squared, and that's in the denominator over here. Additionally, increasing L moves one of the poles closer to the origin. Secondly, the system has a pole of the origin, which is this one over S term over here. This is an integrator. So intuitively, if we give the rod a nudge, an impulse input, the rod rotates to a fixed position and stays there, and that means that's a step output. Lastly, we can ask ourselves what happens if we change C. What happens if there's no friction? That means C equals zero. Now this means that we have two poles of the origin. So if we have c equals zero, we have s squared in the, in the denominator. That means we have a double integrator. Now if you give a rod a nudge, as in an impulse input, the rod will rotate indefinitely. And that is actually a ramp output. So what we'd expect from a double integrator. Motor and propeller modeling is a huge topic in its own right, and something that would take a very long time to cover in any great detail. We therefore restrict our model to a rather simple one. We ignore nonlinearities, drag, friction, and so forth. Ideally, we want a model or transfer function where we apply a voltage or PWM duty cycle, and the output is the re resulting thrust force. We can do this by modeling this conversion from voltage to force via a gain, which we'll call K. This gain is the linearization of the motor's transfer characteristic at a certain idle RPM, or operating point, so to speak. However, we also know that the motor's speed, and therefore its thrust, cannot change instantaneously. Now we can model this effect via a lag or a delay term. This way, a step input results in an exponentially increasing output. The motor transfer function is therefore simply the cascade of the conversion gain and the first order lag. Now the first order lag can also be seen as a low pass filter, 
where high frequency components are attenuated. Tau m is the lag time constant. If tau m is zero, the lag disappears, whereas if tau m is large, there is a larger delay introduced into the system. The overall system model is essentially the cascade of the dynamics of the balanced error pendulum with the motor model we just derived, and this is then the overall transfer function. But what about the sensor model, you might ask? In the real world, we'll be facing many non-idealities, for instance, noisy sensors. We'll have to filter these noisy measurements, but this in turn will introduce additional lag or delay into the system. We will have to take this into account, as too much delay may make the system unstable. As with a motor model, this lag is modelled by a first-order low-pass filter, or first-order lag, with time constant tau f. Finally, let's remember that the system is in continuous time, whereas we'll be implementing the controller as a discrete time system on a microcontroller. Now what happens at this continuous discrete interface? We create an analog signal via the use of a digital to analog converter, or DAC for short. Now this conversion can be modeled via the zero order hold. As always, this again will introduce delay into the system. But the question is, how much delay will this introduce and do we need to really consider it for this uh, system? As a hint, think of bandwidths and sample times. That essentially completes the mathematical modeling part. However, the real work only begins now. How do we even get values for all these system parameters? The masses and lengths are easy to acquire, but the friction coefficient c, as well as motor parameters, such as the conversion gain and time constant, will require more work. I encourage you to think about how you'd get values, or bounds, on these parameters and let me know your ideas in the comments. I'll show you my way in the next video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you then.